And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he, the father, divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered or wasted his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be impoverished. And he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and has come to life again. He was lost, and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Let's pray. Father, what a beautiful story. Not only of a lost son, but of a loving father. Lord, would you speak to us today about just how loving, how merciful, and how full of grace you are. Lord, help us to see today that in heaven's eyes, there are no losers. There are no failures. And there is no one beyond the scope of your grace, your mercy, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, this is an interesting story for lots of reasons. And again, uh, Jesus tells this story in a culture and society which would have read all kinds of things into the story that we'll miss if we're not careful and if we're not brought into context with Jesus' society and Jesus' culture. In Jesus' day, the sons were the ones who inherited the father's wealth when he died. And the way that worked was, uh, when there were two sons in particular, the oldest son got the birthright, and by the birthright, he also got two-thirds of the estate. The younger son, which this lost son was, would have gotten one-third of the estate. But please understand that the estate is not kept in an IRA or a 401k or in a CD or a bank account down at the bank. That, that's not where the wealth is. That's not where the inheritance is. And in Jesus' day, the wealth and the inheritance is tied up in the land and the livestock and the houses and the barns on the property. It's real estate. It's things. And so when this son comes and says, Father, I want my part of the estate, what he's really saying to him is, I want you to liquidate everything and give me what's mine. Now, if we're not careful, we, we have a tendency to think of this story as though the younger son says, come and give me your credit card and let me use it for a while. That's the context we think about it. And if that were the case, we don't really think too much about that anymore. I see young people all the time. When I taught school last year, I saw junior high and high school kids who were carrying around their mom and dad's credit card. They say, Mom, I need to go to the mall afterwards. Give me your credit card. And mom or dad will give me your credit card. I think that's silly, but that's what they would do. But that's not the sense of the story. What this younger son is saying is, Father, I want you to liquidate everything you have and give me my portion. 
That's the sense of what this song is doing. And so the first thing I want you to see in this story is the great disregard that this son has for his father. The great disregard, the great disrespect that he has for his father because in Jesus' day, you didn't get the inheritance until the father was dead. You didn't get the inheritance until the father died. And so what this son was actually saying to the father is, I wish you were dead. He was saying, I wish you were dead. This is an interesting turn in these three parables. You remember our word apollony, which means as good as dead. Now up until this point, the first two parables, we talk about the sheep who is apollony, as good as dead. He's off on his own. He's away from the flock. He's off in the danger. The wolves are looking for him. He could have fallen off of them. He is as good as dead until he is found. It is the lost thing that's as good as dead. Last week we talked about the coin. We talked about all the implications with the dowry headdress. And we talked about the fact that when this coin was lost, this woman's marriage and relationship with her husband, her standing in the community, was as good as dead because she lost this coin off of her dowry headdress. It was the lost item that caused it to be as good as dead. But here we see an interesting turn of events. And Jesus uses this same word, apollony, as good as dead. But all of a sudden, it's not the lost thing that's as good as dead. It's the lost thing that's wishing something else was as good as dead. Because basically what this young boy says to his father is, I wish you were Apollo me. You're as good as dead to me. You offer me nothing other than the stuff you can provide for me. I'm not interested in having a relationship with you. I'm not interested in living under your rules and regulations. I don't need the protection of your house. You're as good as dead to me. Just give me what's mine and I'll go my way. I don't need you anymore. All of a sudden, it's the lost thing that has caused the loving thing to be as good as dead. The great disregard that this son has for the father. Now watch. He has no regard for the father. He has no respect for the father. Because he wants to enjoy the things of the father. And yet have no relationship with the father. And what Jesus is saying in this parable is there are many people in this world who are interested in enjoying the things of the Father but who don't want the relationship with the Father. When we put this in spiritual terms, isn't this the picture of what we see in so many people's lives today? Isn't this a true picture of what we see in our own lives sometimes? When we look in that own, our own spiritual mirror and we see what we're feeling and we see what we're experiencing, many times what we live our life like is this. God, I want all the stuff. I want all the blessings. I, I want you to answer my prayers. I want you to give me protection. I want you to be with my family. I, I want you to do all the stuff that fathers do. But I'm not interested in having a relationship with you. We have a great disregard for the Heavenly Father because we want His stuff, but we don't want Him. We want His blessing, but we don't want the responsibility that goes with the blessing. We want Him to give us Things and money and prosperity and health. And yet we're not interested in having the relationship with the Father that brings about those things. In truth, when we look at this picture of the lost son and his father, the very reason why there was provision and protection, the very reason there was a house and a, and a roof over his head and food to eat on the table and clothes on his back, the very reason for that was because of the relationship he had with the father. All of us as parents have been through that. When our kids get to be about 13 or 14 or 15 years old and they think they can make their own rules, I remember saying to my parents, as long as you're living under my roof, you do things my way. Why is that? Because the benefits of living under my roof come with some responsibilities. And here is a young man who wants the benefits without the responsibilities. We see that in our world today. We see that in the whole philosophy of our world today. Where people who grow up and they become young people and instead of binding 
themselves together in the vows of, of, of marriage and, and living according to God's plan for them. They want all the benefits of marriage without any of the responsibility of marriage. We want all the benefits of church without the responsibility of church. We want to come and we want to be blessed and we want to have a good time. We want to have fellowship. We want to go to all the picnics and all the uh, all the uh, potlucks and, and we want to have somebody to call in case there's a problem. But we're not too keen on the responsibilities of the relationship that comes with being a part of the church. You need both. And so there's great disregard for this father because the son wants the stuff. He wants the things of the Father, but not the relationship of the Father. That's the great disregard we see in this. And that's what Jesus is saying to the people who are listening. But he doesn't stop there. He talks next about the great downfall. There is a great disregard, but there's also a great downfall. Uh, the downfall comes when we waste the resources and we waste the life that the Father gives. That's exactly what the Son does. Matter of fact, it's very interesting to me that in the original language here, when this young man is talking about the resources that his Father has, the, the word that he uses here in the original language is the word bios, which is life. And, and so what the Son is saying is, I want my part of your life now. You're as good as dead to me. I just wish you were out of the picture so I could have what's mine. I want your life. And then the word says he takes that life of his father, that livelihood, the proceeds from all the years that his father has worked and accumulated. He takes that bios, that life of his father, and wastes it. The old King James says, wasted on riotous living. He's a renegade. He goes out and he wastes the money. He wastes the resources. He wastes the life of his father. And that is this young son's downfall. He has great disregard and disrespect for his father. And his downfall is that he takes the very livelihood, the very life of his father, and he wastes it on himself. Folks, listen, that is a perfect picture of our society and our culture today. We are taking the gift of life that God gives us. We are taking this wonderful opportunity to live in an abundant way that God has put at our disposal. And we are wasting our life on ourselves rather than living our life for God. And I want to tell you something. If you're not living your life for God, if you are not living your life committed to Him, if you are not living your life completely dedicated to the purpose and the will of God in your life, you are wasting your life. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much success you have. I don't care how many perks you have. I don't care how big your retirement is. I don't care how big your boat is or how big your house is or how fancy your car is or how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter. If you're not living your life sold out to the cause of Christ, your life is being wasted. And your downfall is that you are wasting the life that God has given you on yourself. Your life was never intended to be lived for you. It was intended to be lived for him. That's the downfall. And so you have this son who has great disregard for his father. He goes out and his downfall is he begins to live his life in such a way that he is wasting the very life, the very livelihood, the very inheritance that his father has given him. And then we see that when the money's gone, when the life that his father has provided for him is gone, and he is at the end of his rope, he finds himself feeding the pigs. He finds himself without friends. He finds himself without any resources whatsoever. And he is brought to the place of decision in his life. You see, that's what happens when we waste our life on ourselves. When we waste our life on trying to build ourselves up. When we waste the resources that God places in our hands on trying to win friends and influence people. That's what happens. 
Uh, because if you haven't already found this out, as long as you have plenty, as long as you have enough to share, as long as you have some benefits uh, that come along with knowing you and being your friend, uh, you have plenty of friends. But when the resources are gone and the money's gone and all the rest is gone, your friends are gone. All those folks that you thought you could count on, that you thought you could trust, the ones who were only there because of the resources you had stolen from the Father or using on yourself and for their entertainment, those folks are gone when the money's gone. In 1970, my dad and I uh, built a house together. Uh, our family had always rented a house, and my dad, uh, in 1970, I was 15 years old, but they said, you know, our family really needs to own our own home. The only way we can own our house is to build it ourselves. So my dad bought an acre of land right across the street from the church he was pastoring. And my dad had never built anything in his life. Uh, my dad was the kind of guy who uh, could do lots and lots of things, but he couldn't change the oil in his own car. Uh, and I doubt if he'd ever made so much as a birdhouse before. But he decided we were going to build a house, and so we did. And uh, there were a few things that we had to hire out because we just couldn't figure out how to do ourselves. And one of those was... Uh, my dad always wanted a big brick fireplace in the living room. And uh, so we needed a bricklayer. And so he asked around for some recommendations, and uh, the name came to him of this guy who was a great bricklayer. And so um, my dad got in touch with him, and he came over and gave us an estimate, and my dad hired him. And so my dad's deal with him was he would pay him every Friday. Now on Monday and, and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, a lot of times he would call my dad before we left the house. And he'd say, Mr. McKinney, can you pick me up today? I don't have a car and I don't have any way to get there. I don't have any friends that can bring me. I don't have any family that can bring me. Could you come and take me to work today and then take me home when I'm done laying bricks today? And of course my dad would do that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday morning, my dad would go pick him up and bring him, and at the end of the day, my dad would pay him for the week. And it was an amazing thing how many friends and family this bricklayer had on Friday afternoon. Everybody wanted to take him home. Everybody wanted to give him a ride. Everybody was his best buddy. He had family crawling out of the woodwork because he had some money. And based on what we found out about this guy later, he was taking the money that he was paid on Friday and taking his friends out, and they had a big party, and they had a big do, and all the money was gone by Saturday, and come Monday morning, nobody to bring him to work. No family, no friends, no car, until the next payday. Then he had all kinds of friends. You see, that's what happened to this guy. He, he spent, he wasted, he devoured the very life that his father put in his hands. And he had lots of friends, no doubt. He had lots of guys down at the local tavern that were slapping him on the back and telling him what a great guy he was and, and, and telling him how good he was and oh boy, I'm so glad to be your friend as long as that money was rolling, as long as he had bills left in his pocket, as long as he could still pay for the drinks and pay for the party. But when his money was gone, when the life was spent, the friends were nowhere to be found. And this young man was put in a place of a great decision. Now what do you do? There's no life left. There's no money left. There's no resources left. And there's no friends left. So now what do you do? And so this younger son was sitting there contemplating his situation one afternoon in the pig pen, and he said, you know what? I don't have any friends, and I don't have anybody who will take care of me, and I don't have any money left, and I don't have any resources, and the only job I have is feeding these pigs, and to be honest, I'm about hungry enough to eat what they're eating. But I know a man who has plenty, my dad, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just go back to my dad and I'll ask my dad to hire me and he'll pay me a wage and probably only right that I pay my dad back for all that he gave me. Now, you see the decision he made? In one way, we say this is a good decision. He decides to go home. 
In, in one way, we say, this is, a, this is a worthwhile decision. He's decided to return to the place where he went off track. And, and we think, that's admirable, that's good. And, and then we begin to look at this man, we say, oh, that's respectable, that's good. He, he's going to go home. But I want you to understand something. Even though part of the decision to go home was a good decision, part of the decision was a very bad decision. Because he's going to go home, not as a slave. A slave isn't paid. A slave is just given a place to live, food to eat in exchange for his work. But no, he wants to be a hired hand so that he can earn money, so that every week he gets a paycheck, so that he can pay his dad back, so that somehow he can earn his way back into his father's favor. See, in one way, this is a good decision because he says, I'm going to go back to the Father. But in another way, it's a very bad decision because he's making a decision to go back and try to earn his way into his Father's love again, to buy back his Father's favor again. And so this great decision that he makes, on one hand, is a good decision. On the other hand, is a bad decision, which brings us to his homecoming. It brings us to the place where this young man gets up and heads home, and his father's been watching for him, and his father is looking out the window, and, and his father sees him coming down the road, and his father runs. Now understand that this is something that in Jesus' culture, that in Jesus' society, fathers didn't do. Mothers ran, children ran, but fathers didn't run because in order for a father to run, he had to take the rope and he had to take the long skirts of the rope and he had to gird them up and, and put them up out of the way so they didn't trip. And it was not seen as something that was respectable for a man, especially a father, especially a landowner to do. And so this father sees his son coming and he does the unthinkable. And the people who are listening to this story that Jesus is telling would have known that. They would have known what was. What unusual thing is happening here? This father girds his, his skirts up and he begins to run down the road toward his son. And his son says, Father, I've sinned against you. I have sinned against God. I want you to hire me back so that I can begin to accumulate some money. So that I can pay you back. So that I can earn my way back into your favor. And I want you to see the great demonstration that this father gives to the son. Son. He listens to the son's plan and he says no. I will not hire you back. I will not let you earn money in order to try to buy your way back into a relationship with me. I will not let you try to earn your way back into the family. Absolutely not. That's your plan? It's a bad plan. Here's my plan. Bring the road. Bring the family ring with the signet on it that is a sign of being a member of our close family. Kill the fatted calf. Bring the sandals. Let's celebrate for my son who was, now watch the flip, for my son which was Apollo me, as good as dead, lost, has come back to life. My son which was Apollo me, lost, as good as dead, has been found. Earlier we said that it is the son who is causing the father to be lost because he has said, you're as good as dead to me. But even though the son has said to the father, I wish you were dead. I just want the stuff. I don't want a relationship with you. I just want what you can provide. I don't want to love you. I don't want to be responsible to you. I just want what you can give me. I just want your stuff. I don't want you. He made the father as good as dead. And now the father looks at the the son and says, you were a colony, not me. You were a colony. You were as good as dead. And no, you can't earn your way back in. No, you can't buy your way back into this family. No, you can't ever earn enough money. You can't ever do enough good to undo what you did. There's only one way for you to ever be a part of our family again, and that's for me to extend you grace and mercy and welcome you back with open arms and call you son. Jesus tells this story to people who by this point must be in absolute shock that this father who has been shown such great disregard whose wealth has been taken and spent on horrible ways of living and who has 
been further insulted by this son coming back and saying, I think I can earn enough. I think I can make enough wealth. I think I can somehow make you want to love me again. I think somehow I can make you let me back into the family again. All of this, this audience is listening, and Jesus says, no, the Father says there's only one way. Only one way to be in the family, and that's for me to welcome you with grace. Now watch the spiritual parallel, folks. Jesus says that some of us are lost because we have decided that we want the Father's stuff without the relationship. We want the benefits without the responsibility. And he says, those of us who are like that, who have enjoyed the life that God has given us, the very fact that we're breathing, the very fact that our heart is beating, the very fact that our minds work and that we can discern, that we can learn, that we can have children, that we can have families, all of this is a result of the fact that our Heavenly Father has given us this wonderful, abundant life. But some of us say, we want all this stuff, but we don't want you. We've gone on our way and we've taken all the stuff that God has placed in our hands and we have used it on ourselves and we have burnt our life up and wasted it on ourselves. And some of us, Jesus says, even come to the place in our life where we say, you know what, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have run from God all this time. I, I need to go to God. But some of us come back to God like this son came back to the Father and say, I can do enough good. I can go to church enough. I can give enough money. I can be baptized. I can do this. I can do that. And if I do enough good stuff, maybe God will accept me into his family. Maybe God will forgive me. And Jesus says, that's not the way my father works. He doesn't work on a merit system. He doesn't work on brownie points. He doesn't work by you buying your way or earning your way or being good enough to get into the family of God. You come back and you say, I've sinned against you, Father. I've sinned against you. I, I, have, I have spent all that you've given me on myself. And I am unworthy to be called a son. But I have nothing left to do except to fall in your face, my face, before you, to fall and ask for your mercy and for your grace. And Jesus says the good news is the Father. The Father will always welcome us back. The Father shows this great demonstration of love every time he receives one of us into the family of God. And Jesus says in this story that there is this great celebration. And we know from the preceding two stories that what he's saying is that the celebration that he's talking about here between the father and the son who's been lost is just to show us that there's also a celebration that happens in heaven when a lost son or a lost daughter comes home. So I have a few questions I'd like to ask you today. The first one is this. Are you one of those people who has been wanting to have the Father's stuff without having a relationship with the Father? Are you one of those people who has been enjoying the goodness of life the resources of life, the blessings of life. You're one of those people who, who has been so richly blessed. And, and you've enjoyed that stuff, but you haven't been grateful enough. You haven't been respectful enough. You haven't regarded the Father enough to be willing to have a relationship with him. I say, well, preacher, when you put it that way, that makes me sound like a pretty bad person. No, it, it just makes you a lost son or a lost daughter who's like all the other lost sons and lost daughters before they come home. Caught up in living life for yourself and enjoying the things of life rather than enjoying the author of life. Look at this next question. Wait. 
changes his life. Today, are you experiencing failure in your life? Trying to live your life without relationship between you and your Creator? You know, it always amazes me at how many people are willing to live their life failing time and time and time and time again. Experiencing heartache and grief and, and loneliness and depression and so many things in their life and yet they refuse to call out to the Father. Some of us are stubborn and some of us are just made that way and we're independent and we want to do it on our own but the truth is folks that we all need to come to the place in our life where this young lost son came to realize that there is no hope there is no help there is no way out except through the father that's it so are you tired of experiencing that kind of failure in your life without Jesus because if you are the father is waiting like this young man's father was with open arms, saying, just come on. Which brings me to the last question I want you to look at today. In, in all that we've talked about, in all that we've seen, could it be that today you are ready to make the greatest decision of your life? A decision that says, I'm going to come home to the Father. I'm not going to try to earn my way in because I know I can't do that. I'm not going to be good enough for God to love me because I'm good. I know that. But I'm just going to come home and I'm going to say, Lord, I've been living my life for me and I want to live it for you. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but your word says you always forgive me. 